thanks for that introduction, I think. Uh, it certainly uh, does sound like, yeah, I'm a nerd now, uh, all that uni stuff. Um, but uh, I remember the band fondly, and I've bumped into people today who've just come up to me and said, oh, I remember the band, and uh, Alan said, oh, your band came to, uh, was it Berrimah Jail, right? Yeah, uh, indeed, we did. Uh, we were invited to go into Berrimah Jail. <laughs> uh, you can see my topic, uh, humility, although I'm pretentious enough to put it in Latin, uh, humilitas, so uh, there's a problem right there. Uh, and so I've been asked to talk on this topic, but I, I, although I've spoken on this topic many times and even went so far as to write a book on the topic, I, I haven't worked out a way of getting around the obvious dilemma because I reckon if I was sitting where you are, I'd be looking at this guy claiming he's going to talk on humility and thinking, hang on, who does he think he is? Is he, is he, the, is he claiming to be the expert on humility, because if he is, he isn't. <laughs> and if he's not the expert on humility, why would he be talking to us about it? Because humility is one of those weird things. I could be talking about any other topic and you'd think, oh yeah, I'll give that a listen. But as soon as someone reckons they're going to get up and give a really good talk on humility, it's weird. Because uh, humility is one of those things where as soon as you think you've got it, you probably don't. But if you don't think you've got humility, that's no guarantee that you do. Because you could be an arrogant jerk after all. You'd be correct. Now, the whole thing is much worse for me because I did go and write a book on it. And that's the title of the book up, up there. Um, and my publisher took the mickey out of me when we got very close to uh, publishing the book. They got their art department to put together a mocking title page. And I've just realized I don't normally show this in public, and yet this is being filmed. Okay, so, <clears throat> I don't know what I'm going to do. We will edit this out, because I'm really embarrassed with what they did. You ready? Humility and how I achieved it. <laughs> <clears throat> how good's that? Take the dare to be more Dixon. And so the art department of the publisher was ripping on me. And you can see little commentary on the top there saying how awesome this book is. But it's me saying how awesome this book is. It has a review on the back by me. Uh, I get that away. I really hope we can edit that out because I just don't want that out. But the thing is, this humility topic, especially since I put the book out on it, has uh, nonetheless taken me to some amazing places. And I'm more than ever convinced that a lot of people see the value of humility. So I've been invited to speak uh, to military about the topic of humility. Uh, I've spoken to the education department about humility. I even once uh, spoke to a fitness conference where I looked like I didn't belong at all on this topic of humility, but the most bizarre invitation I've ever had to talk on the topic of humility came in late 2011 when I got an email asking me to go and speak to a football team. And uh, it was a football team from America, and I didn't really know American football. I'd never watched an American football game, so I didn't recognize the team. I saw down the bottom of the invitation that they had like their own logo and everything, so I thought they were maybe semi-professional at least. And so I had to uh, email or uh, text my son to ask them who were the Green Bay Packers. <laughs> I now know who the Green Bay Packers are, but in, uh, in 2011 I had zero idea. So I text my son, and here's the text. I'm not sure if you can uh, see this. Uh, check your email, I've been invited to speak on humility to the Green Bay Packers team, are they any good? <laughs> Josh replied, what? You are kidding, no, no, they won the Super Bowl last season, are winning so far this season, can I come with you, please? <laughs> so he came, 
And uh, I got to speak to the team on the topic of humility. We got a tour of the ground. We went to the game. We had lunch with the team. The team signed a ball for Josh. Uh, and it was an amazing experience. I've been back to the Packers uh, every year since 2011 and very often talking on this theme. For them, it's a really important theme. For these people who are giants in the NFL uh, and uh, yesterday won against the Chicago Bears, I hope that doesn't annoy anyone, uh, but it's just the right result and everything. Humility for them remains a favorite theme. So what I want to do today is I want to give you the very talk I gave the Green Bay Packers, if that's okay. Uh, Because it's not often I get to talk simply to to sort of men's meetings. Uh, I began with the Packers uh, talking about what humility is, because it's really uh, often misunderstood as involving being a little mouse. And if you've got great talent and skill and power, you don't want to feel like you're a mouse, because that's ridiculous. It's irrational, and surely if you have gifts and powers, you ought to be able to use them for others. Now, that's a misunderstanding of humility, though. It doesn't mean humiliation. It doesn't mean being small. It doesn't mean hiding your talents. This is what humility means. It is the noble choice to forego your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. Or if you like the simple dummies version, hold your power in service of others. The important thing here is, humility is not denying that you have stuff to contribute. It's a decision to use that stuff, that strength, that skill that you have for others. And I do believe that men need to focus on humility. Whether you're an NFL quarterback like Aaron Rodgers, or you're a fitter and turner, truck driver, doctor, teacher, humility is taking whatever skill you have and not using it for yourself, using it for others. And I've got a bit of an argument that I want to lay out uh, for why I think humility is powerful life-changing, not just for you, but for people around you. Uh, Here's the first thing I want to say about humility. At one level, it's just common sense. At one level, it's common sense. Because what we don't know, even collectively in this room, what we don't know and can't do is far greater than what we do know and can do. Even in a room like this, with, I don't know, 250, 300 guys, some of whom are going to be experts at various things, Even still, what we don't know, what we can't do, is far bigger than what we do know and can do. So a little humility, a little recognition that we need each other, I reckon is worthwhile. Some of you may know that completely untrue story of four people in a plane that lost all power to its engines and started careering toward the earth. The pilot came out to the three passengers and said, look, we've got a problem, we're going down uh, and there's only three parachutes. My plane, my parachutes, I've got to take one. They agreed that he should take one of the parachutes. He jumped out to safety. Left on the plane are a brilliant professor, a minister of religion, and a backpacker making his way around the world. And uh, the brilliant professor got up and said, look, I'm one of the greatest minds in the world. I surely have to survive. I must take one of the last parachutes. And the others said, well, you know, that kind of makes sense. You know, you'd be really missed. So, yeah, sure. He straps it on, jumps out. The minister starts to say to the backpacker, look, I've lived a long life. I know where I'm going when this plane crashes. You take the last parachute. It's okay. And the backpacker said, no, no, it's okay. That brilliant professor, he just jumped out with my backpack strapped on. (laughs) Okay, now, completely untrue but illustrates something that is true. Being an expert in one area is no guarantee of expertise in another. That's a particular problem, jumping out of an aircraft at 30,000 feet with nothing but a PhD and a backpack. Your expertise isn't helping. But it's also a problem on the ground. Because when you become really good at something, or when you have a skill or a strength of some kind, 
The temptation is to think that you can project from that to all the other things. You extrapolate from your skill. But the reality is expertise in one area counts for almost nothing in another. So a little humility just makes sense. No matter how good you are at something, no matter how strong you are, how wealthy, how politically powerful, how many people you have working for you, that expertise doesn't carry across. And so what we don't know and can't do far exceeds what we do know and can do. A little humility is just common sense. But here's the, the other direction I want to move in. It's not just common sense. Humility is also beautiful. Now, I hope you don't misunderstand what I'm saying here. I mean, psychologically, we are way more attracted to the great who are humble than the great who are arrogant jerks. I don't know if you've ever met like a famous sportsman or some you know, powerful person. And the experience goes like this. You meet them, you shake their hand, and all they want to do is talk about themselves and how good they are. It's, it's a real turn-off. You can have a hero who you meet, and it turns out they're a jerk, and you go away, and that just chips away at their greatness in your mind. You know the experience, right? But what if you meet someone who's great? Maybe it's a sports hero. Maybe it's, I don't know, a film star or a rock and roll star. Or, or maybe it's just someone in business you've really admired and you meet them. And they're more interested in you than you are in them. And they're not, like, fussed about being reverenced, being respected. They're just like one of us. Your appreciation of that person goes up, not down. Humility is beautiful. It reminds me of one of the uh, great true stories of humility. There's uh, three young lads hopped on a bus in Detroit in the 1930s and apparently tried to pick a fight with the man at the back of the bus, who was this big guy, but at his seated position, he didn't look so big, and uh, there were three of them anyway, and they started to pick a fight with him, insult him. He didn't respond, just really calm. They insulted him even more. He didn't respond. And then he stood up because it was his stop to get off the bus, and they realized he was actually quite a bit bigger than they had guessed. And he reached into his pocket, and he gave them a business card with his name on it and hopped off the bus. And the young lads gathered around the business card seriously and read the words, Joe Lewis, professional boxer. <laughs> they had just tried to pick a fight with the man who would very soon become heavyweight boxing champion of the world from 1937 to 49. How lucky were they? This, I mean, seriously, this is a guy they said could knock out a horse with one blow. I have no idea how he got the reputation, whether that was a practice schedule or something, but that's what they used to say. Lucky they were that he was in a good mood. But actually, the thing is, Joe Lewis was um, famous for his humility. At the peak of his career, when he was earning tons of money, uh, he decided to pay back the city of Detroit all of the welfare checks that his family had received over the years. Because he just felt it was wrong that he could have so many things and not give back to the city. He was known to be walking the streets of Detroit handing out $20 bills to people he thought were in need. Because he thought, it's ridiculous, I've got all this money, and there are all these people with needs. Here is a guy who held his power for the good of others. And my point is just this, and I, I could tell you story after story from the military, uh, from business, from sport, from just simple relationships, parenting, teaching, where humility is beautiful and arrogance is ugly. But has it always been so? Here's the really weird thing. Humility in the ancient world, in Greece and Rome, before Christianity came along, humility 
did not mean a virtuous thing. Humility, the word humilitas, actually meant pushed down low, crushed. Humility was a negative word. Humility before the gods was acceptable because they could kill you. Humility toward the emperor or someone above you was valid because, of course, you have to debase yourself before great people. But humility before someone who is your equal made no sense. Humility before someone who is your lesser was actually irrational. So the question is, and there's quite a lot of nerdy research on this, how did our Western world come to believe that humility is beautiful? How did people come to believe that a Joe Lewis character ought to hold his power for the good of others? Well, I was involved in a documentary and part of it was exploring this theme. Humility in Greek and Roman ethics would be a, a degrading thing, to put yourself down to a level th that you were not born to or that your standing in life did not require you to be in was disgraceful and debasing. There was no virtue in it at all. So what happened? How did the West come to despise honour-seeking and prize humility? The evidence points firmly in one direction. Jesus of Nazareth. It's true that Jesus taught an ethic of humility. He once said, whoever wants to be great must be your servant. But it probably wasn't his teaching that changed things decisively. It was his death. It's difficult today to grasp just how much of a catastrophe Jesus' crucifixion was to those who loved him. To hear that a Messiah, a great king, uh, a, an important person was crucified, well, it would be nonsense to the Greek or the Roman ear. It couldn't make sense of it. In fact, Roman citizens were not crucified for that very reason. It was just so shameful. So for the gospel message to proclaim a crucified Lord, it, it upended the value system that the Romans held. The shameful death of Jesus posed a difficult question for his first followers. Was he not as great as they thought, given the nature of his execution? Or does greatness itself have to be redefined to include a willingness to lower yourself for the sake of others? For Christians, the answer was obvious. Greatness involves humility. It was a turning point in the ethics of the Western world, and we can date it precisely. From a prison in Rome 30 years after Jesus, the Apostle Paul, author of much of the New Testament, urges Christians to follow Jesus' example of humble self-sacrifice. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The idea isn't that you need to be a Christian to understand the beauty of humility. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying, historically speaking, even leaving aside theology, our Western culture has been massively influenced by a story that upended the view of greatness that Greeks and Romans held. Their vision of greatness was, if you've got powers, use them for your advantage. Gain honor for yourself. Use your power in the world because nature expects you, if you have powers, to use them so that you can rise up above the weak. That was the Roman and the Greek mentality. And then entering into our story as Westerners was this thought that God of infinite power enters the world 
lives the life we couldn't live, gives that life on a cross so we could be forgiven. And yes, rises again in power, but the crucial turning point that I'm talking about is that this greatness sacrificed itself for others. And suddenly, our culture is informed by a story that says true greatness means giving yourself for others. True greatness is using what you've got to help others. And even if you're an atheist today, I bet you've been influenced by this story, even at subliminal levels. So that even atheists today still reckon when a great person is humble, it's beautiful. And when they're arrogant, it sucks. That is the influence of Christ on our culture. One of the many influences. So my point is, humility is common sense, but it's also beautiful. And I often feel this in my marriage, in my parenting, let alone my professional life. Am I using the powers that I have for their good instead of tossing around my powers for my good? The third thing I want to say is that humility is the fast track to improve. So there's actually a personal benefit to humility. It's not just a benefit to others, it's a benefit to ourselves. And the logic is this. The humble person in a room like this, or at any conference you might go to, is going to go away with more things than, than the arrogant person. See, there'll be some people sitting here going, oh, what's this guy got to teach me? You know, their arms folded. I'm not picking on the arms folded, guys. I, I see this one there. Actually, one of my mates is sitting there just going like this. He's going, oh, what can Dicko possibly teach me? I'm an astrophysicist. I don't need anything, anyone else. That person, I don't mean that person. I mean, th that person with that mentality, no matter what the situation, is closed to new things, right? It's just obvious. But there may be someone just as intelligent, just as skillful, just as powerful, who's sitting there with a more sort of open mentality to say, you know, sure, I'm great at all sorts of things, but there's, there's maybe something this guy can teach. There's maybe something I can pick up from this. And that openness, that humility, is actually your fast track to improve. And there is so much evidence of this working in different fields in the scientific field, in the educational field. But one famous one is from the business field. One of the great professors of uh, business studies, Jim Collins, uh, did a large-scale study in America of the top businesses in America. And one of the things they found is that in the top output businesses, uh, almost without fail, the top, top leader was a person of humility. And it blew the research team away. They were not expecting it. And they found uh, that the level five leader, that is the leader who's uh, led an organization through massive transformation and massive growth, was, and I quote, a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. Uh, he followed it up with a book that was fascinating uh, called How the Mighty Fall, where he analyzed companies that had collapsed, companies that had really dipped. And one of the things he found is one of the greatest predictors of business collapse was where the CEO became arrogant because of success. Humility is the fast track to improve. And this is true even if it's accidental humility. Uh, as mentioned earlier, one of, uh, well, my first career was singing in a rock and roll band. And we got to tour all sorts of amazing places, including the Daly River up in the Northern Territory, where we were invited to play a concert to the uh, indigenous community up there. It was fantastic. We got to stay overnight there, uh, do a concert. And they took us out to lunch as a thank you. And we're sitting by the Daly River, the most crocodile-infested river in the Northern Territory, eating these... Uh, I can't remember what they are now. There's something pods, little nuts that they that they that they um, cooked up, and a, and a turtle that the that the woman Molly cooked for us. But basically, it was an ant-infested, slimy turtle. They just threw live onto the barbecue until you know it stopped moving, and that's when it was cooked. And uh, and then this old fella uh, in the community said, uh, "You guys are musicians." 
do you want me to teach you how to play the didgeridoo? And I went, oh yeah, I'll go, I'll go first, right? Push myself forward. And then he, for the next five minutes, I kid you not, he spat down the didgeridoo. <laughs> Just worked up all the saliva in his mouth and spat down it until it was literally dribbling out, dribbling out the end and frothing over the top. At which point he passed it to me to play. Now, I've since discovered that a wet didgeridoo, because it fills the pores in the wood, um, sounds much better than a dry didgeridoo. At the time, I'm thinking, hang on, is this some trick they just play on the tourists, right? But here I am in this amazing setting, about to learn the didgeridoo from a master, and I thought, I don't, like, here I am sitting in the dirt, crocodiles behind me, ant-infested turtle, the most saliva-filled thing I'd ever seen. And I decided to pucker up, took a deep breath, and started to play. I got the best lesson I could possibly have got on the didgeridoo in the next half hour. And even though at the time it was kind of disgusting, it actually became, the didgeridoo became a really important part of uh, my, my band. And here's the incriminating evidence. Okay, now I realize showing you me playing the didgeridoo is not very humble, uh, but, but it does illustrate something I want to say. This was forced humility, but it was also the fast track to improvement. I learned something in that low place I could never have learned anywhere else. Because sometimes it is puckering up to the horrible, facing some really low circumstance that puts you in the negative, as it were. That is your fast track to improvement. It's the confrontation at work where you decide to back down. It's the moment where you know you have rights, but for the sake of a family member and to keep the peace, you show a gentleness and a humility. These low moments can be the fast track to improvement, not just in business, not just in music or sport, but in relationships. You can be the better version of yourself. It's also true in spirituality. Perhaps especially true. Because the, you know, the arrogant person who's sort of got a really high opinion of themselves and, and, and because of that high opinion they block out alternative views or views that they don't like, that person is very unlikely to develop in the spiritual realm. But someone who is equally, equally intelligent, equally skilled, but has a humble mindset is in a much better place to advance on that spiritual level. And there's this amazing story that Jesus of Nazareth told to a bunch of people who were full of themselves. And he basically said, that keeps you from God. Here's the story he told. It's, it's called a parable, right? Which is just a hypothetical Jesus used to make an amazing point. Here it is. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, okay, you know the type, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, that's a religious conservative, and the other a tax collector, often seen as greedy and treacherous. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, you know, because what else would he pray about? God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. Oh, he's so good. But Jesus goes on in this story. He says, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus continued that this man, the second, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home 
justified before God, in the right with God. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Here is Jesus, who obviously embodied humility in his death and resurrection, but teaching humility before God. And he basically says, the self-righteous person, the person who thinks they're good through and through and only getting better, can't see God. The person who knows their own soul is willing to admit it and call out to God, hey, please have mercy on me. That person is justified by God, is exalted by God. What an amazing idea. I remember when this first crashed in on me as a 16-year-old. I'd never been inside a church before I was 16, not once. We'd never said prayers in our home, a completely godless upbringing. But I did have a teacher who was really openly Christian at my state school. And uh, her name was Glenda Weldon. And I went up to Mrs. Weldon after class in my school and I asked her a question that actually was the turning point in my whole life, actually. I said to her, look, I know you talk about God and stuff like that. Can I ask you, what do you think God thinks of me? I'm not saying God's real, but if he is, what does he think of me? And she was really smart. She said, John, God sees everything you have done, said, and thought. And I remember as a 16-year-old thinking, oh no, that's, that's really not good. And then she said, but he loves you even still. He loves you even still. I thanked her for the comment. I shot out into the playground. I tried to forget those words, but they went round and round in my head like on a loop. God sees everything I've done, said, and thought, but he loves me even still. And over the next few days, these words sort of brought me to a position where I knew I needed God's mercy. And it was months, maybe even a year after that, that I eventually learnt enough about Christ and his death and resurrection for me to actually, like the tax collector in the story, say, God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. But my point, of course, is that there's no discovering any of that stuff where there's arrogance. Because humility is not only the fast track to improve in the business realm, in the family realm, and so on. It is also, in a sense, the doorway to seeing what is most real in the world. Here's my point, and here's where I end. Humility is common sense. Because what we don't know and can't do far exceeds what we do know and can do. But humility is also beautiful. When you hold your power for the sake of others, instead of push it around, it is, inc it is compelling to those you engage with, for your kids, for your wife, for your workmates, on the field. It's beautiful. But finally, and perhaps most importantly, it's the fast track for our own improvement at work, at the home, and above all, with God. God bless. Okay. Thank you, John. So, um, if you want to throw your hand up, Henry down he's got a roving mic. If, you want to, if you've got any questions, um, then please wait until the mic gets to you so that we can all hear the question and then John will uh, answer it. Uh, John, just wondering if your teacher, uh, when you're 16, learned of your coming to faith. Yeah, good one. She absolutely did because you know what she did uh, about, I don't know, a, few, a couple of months after she, I asked that question and she could tell I was pretty rocked by it. 
Um, she did what would be illegal now, so I'm not recommending it. She invited the whole class she taught to her home for hamburgers, milkshakes, scones, and Bible study. And I was not too interested in the Bible study. I'd never opened a Bible, so I didn't really know, but it didn't sound good. But the hamburgers, milkshakes, and scones, we thought would be a fair trade-off. So we went to her home in a pack of lads. I mean a pack. And ate her food, uh, which was you know, fantastic. Hamburgers, milkshakes, and scones with jam, which I don't think I'd ever had. And at that point where we were so full, we couldn't even get up out of her couch, she brought out the Bible. And I remember thinking, she's trapped us. Maybe, maybe she's like a witch and she's like got us in the couch. She brought out the Bible and she said, have you got questions? And we had so many questions. And here was an opportunity for me to ask questions that weren't just smart aleck questions, which is the sort of thing that I would do in school. The smart aleck question to make the teacher look silly. But here was an opportunity to ask normal questions because I'd worked out that the smart aleck question didn't work with this teacher. She was too smart. And so I was in a space where I could ask honest questions. And I got amazing answers. And, and what she did, this was the turning point, really. Over the next, I don't know, maybe year and a half of Friday afternoons eating her hamburgers and Bible study, she read to us the four Gospels. These are the first four books of the New Testament. They are the biographies of Jesus. We know they're written in the first century, the actual century of Jesus. So it's incredibly early. She read the story of Jesus to us. And I remember just over months thinking, he's awesome. How come I didn't know this? And, and, and I was so struck by the combination. I wouldn't have put it like this at the time, but reflecting back, I, I think this is what I saw. The combination in Christ of absolute power. Absolute power combined with a gentleness combined with a, uh, a kind of sacrificial mode of existence, like a willingness to give himself on a cross. And I just became the biggest fan of Jesus. And over months, a follower of Jesus, a worshipper of Jesus. And um, yeah, it completely changed my life. Now, I stayed in touch with that teacher until she died two years ago. And uh, the family asked me to lead her funeral, which was one of the hardest things I've, uh, I've done in ministry. But it was also a privilege because I knew exactly what she would want me to say. Uh, so it was like one of those occasions where I, I didn't have to make it up. And she was so um, keen for people to know about Christ. And so with this captive audience at her funeral, I got to tell them uh, about Christ. I can't even remember your question now, but that's an answer to something. John, you mentioned that what we would hear this morning was the exact presentation you made to the Green Bay Packers. Yeah. Was that true in terms of your yeah. references to Christ? Yeah, yeah. Can, um, can because you, because can they you don't mind... Us, yep, can you sorry. give us the background as to why mm. they wanted to hear that? Um, because their chaplain heard me give this talk in America, saw the book, and passed it on to Coach McCarthy, the, the coach of the Packers. And... Um, Coach really liked it um, because the, the, the Christianity bit in the book is not, you know, it's not, it's not huge, but it's there. I mean, the stuff that I, you know, some of the stuff anyway that I've spoken on today is in the book. And so they were totally cool with the Christian thing. And quite a number of the team are Christians. Coach McCarthy himself wasn't uh, a Christian, but he just, uh, you know, as a pretty powerful leader in the NFL, he, he knew the value of humility. And so it was in that context that I was allowed to... Um, talk about my Christian faith. And each time I've gone back to talk to them, th there's the expectation that I talk about Christianity. Yeah. Awesome, John. Thanks so much. Just um, great message on humility, but I'm just reflecting on as a Christian, there's a sense where we can be called arrogant for having the one and only truth. Yeah. How do you juggle that? Uh, and what's your advice, I guess, for us where we believe to have the only answer to eternal salvation yeah so um there's no probably no avoiding the sometimes people accusing you of being arrogant but the thing is if you're a beggar and you stumble across a bakery and you go and tell other beggars where you found some bread and they say oh you're so arrogant to think you've found some bread you sort of go um doesn't doesn't feel arrogant like i just want you to have some bread and that's how i think about the christian faith you stumble across the truth and you just want to share it with people yes it can seem arrogant it can, but it doesn't need to be arrogant. 
It can be just a simple explanation of the truth. Now, you can do that arrogantly, and that's totally inappropriate. If you think, if, if your approach to sort of explaining Christianity is, let me tell you what I have discovered in my own wisdom and rationality to be true, you need to listen, it's the truth, then you sound like a jerk. But if it's really just, I knew nothing, and I've just found the most amazing treasure, and I really want you to know about it. I think it's the treasure. I can't not think that. Then I think people are going to give you uh, a listen. The other thing to hold in mind, though, is that every viewpoint could be accused of being arrogant on the same grounds. The person who accuses you of arrogance is obviously thinking that they're right, aren't they? Because they're saying you're wrong to think that. So they're saying I'm right to think that. So the whole thing could come back to bite them just as easily. So I think we can put aside that and um, admit that sometimes Christians are arrogant. But being a Christian and believing that Christ is the only way of salvation is not in itself arrogant. And, and, and in any case, I would say, the more you genuinely believe in Christ, the more his humility will have an effect on you. Because we, we've not, those of us who believe this stuff, haven't come to believe in a Lord who's like Superman and can just, you know, crush everything. No. If you believe in a God of absolute majesty, full stop, then that could inspire arrogance. But if you come to believe that absolute majesty is more interested in loving and serving others, then your absolute belief in that one should encourage humility. The kind of Lord we believe in should promote humility. John, you talked about uh, spiritual things. What do you think the normal Aussie is into as far as spirituality? You know, what's, what does Australia worship? Hmm. Well, uh, a, a lot of different things. Um, it seems to me Australians uh, have two views of Christianity sitting in their head already, like the average Australian. Uh, one view is entirely negative. Christians are arrogant, <laughs> to pick up on that. They're, they're jerks, they're hypocrites, they're pedophiles, they cover up pedophilia, right? Like, there's that negative thing. And we, we partly deserve that. But the average Australian also has this whole other perception of Christians as like the people who look after, when, look after you when you're down and out. They're the ones with hospices for the dying and you know, the salvos knock on your door and they've got a vision of what Christianity is meant to be. So I first just want to say, it seems to me Australia, even though if you, if you listen to just certain um, media outlets, you might get the impression that all Australians think Christianity is dumb and mean. But I reckon, as I travel around, I reckon the average Australian it doesn't think that. They think two things at the same time. And when they bump into Christians who are a little bit arrogant, it activates that perception of the Christian that's sitting there in the head. When they meet Christians who are really loving and kind and, 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 and serving and so on, it activates that other positive vision of what a Christian is. That's, that's the Christianity that, that I know is meant to be Christianity. But you asked a more profound question, what are they, what are they worshipping? Um, the, the thing is, I mean, we are worshipping creatures. We are, we are searching for something higher than ourselves. That's just the way we're made. There's no way around it. And we tend to fill it with all sorts of things. And sometimes we can just fill it with sex, with pornography. We can fill it with getting drunk with the mates. Uh, we can fill it with um, sport, you know, because we're looking for kind of um, uh, victories. We're looking to be part of a team. And all these things are ultimately spiritual. There was someone at the very beginning of the 20th century said, every man who knocks on the door of a prostitute is looking for God. And what they meant was, there's something empty in their soul. And they're looking for a kind of intimacy, they're looking for satisfaction, but ultimately this can only be found in God. And so I, I genuinely believe that um, Aussies are worshipping the creation instead of the creator. We are world experts at loving you know, time off, uh, great cars, good stereo, 
uh, clothes, uh, a house with a decent block. Uh, we, we love, love, love these things. We're pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. And the problem is um, not that those things are wrong. They're great, but they're gifts, not the giver. And if you obsess about the gift and ignore the giver, that's not so good. But when you know the giver, you can see these things as gift, and they even have more meaning. Okay, your dad died at nine. This is a follow-up. Um, when you became a believer, uh, how did you look at that when you became a believer? Your dad dying in a plane crash. Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a difficult one and deserves its own talk. I think there are many things that can be said about the problem of evil and suffering, and I, I can't solve them here. But I will, I will say this. Um, my question at nine to mum was, why did God let dad's plane crash? Which is really weird because I'd never been in a church. So I don't know why I was thinking God was to blame for it. We we're not a religious household. She has no idea what she said in reply. She can't recall. But the thing is, when I was 18, I'd been a Christian for two years, and I began to see my mates become mates with their fathers. And I experienced the loss of my dad more as an 18-year-old than I did as a 9-year-old. Because I suddenly realized I don't have a dad to grow into being a friend with. And as I saw my mates become mates with their dads, oh, I had a real faith crisis. My question at 9 was just, why did God let dad's plane crash? My question at 18 is, I knew, I knew there was a God. I think the arguments for God are just so compelling. But I did find myself thinking, where are you, God? What do you know of my pain? Sure, you wound up the universe and let it unroll. But, but where are you in the midst of my, my sorrow and my doubt and so on? And this same teacher, Glenda Weldon, knew I was going through this terrible time. And she said, John, it is okay for you to doubt all of that stuff for you to feel angry at God. That's just fine. But do it looking at the cross. They were her words. Look, uh, do it looking at the cross. What did she mean? She meant when you look at the cross and realize that this is God giving himself for us, you suddenly know that God himself has wounds. God himself has suffered. He suffered betrayal from his best friends. He suffered a joke trial a scandal legally. He suffered a beating from the Roman soldiers. He suffered nails through his hands and feet. He's experienced what it is to, to, to breathe a final breath on the cross. That's the God you bring your questions to. So when you say, God, what do you know about my pain? You bring it to a God who knows everything about your pain because that God understands our pain, not just because he is all-knowing, but because he has experienced it. And that changed it for me. Because it meant that even though I've struggled at times with this thought, I can bring those struggles to a God who's sympathetic, who knows what I feel and thinks it's okay for me to feel what I feel. And that makes, I seriously think that makes a world of difference. Um, yeah, just with your interest in history in particular, there's been a lot of public debates about um, issues to do with human origins. You've got like Steve Nye and uh, Ken Ham, and then you've got people like uh, even George Pell debating with Richard Dawkins, and then you've got kind of on the other end of the spectrum people like Francis Collins. Um, with your interest in history, and I guess it's prehistory, particularly in the last couple of weeks, there's been this talk about this 3.8 million year old skull, humanoid skull in the afar being found. I'm just wondering where you might lie on that spectrum and in all these debates it's there's a lot of lack of humility I guess expressed on both sides with the opinions coming out. I just wondered what your thoughts on, the, on that were. Well you're certainly right that there's a lack of humility on, on both sides um, and I've, I've been guilty of that in the past because uh, you know when I formed my view after reading all that I've read uh, I have in, at times tended to look down on those who don't share my view and, I, and I've, I've been rebuked on that and I'm glad that people have kind of rebuked me on that because it's just, it's just, to, be a, it's just to be a jerk. Um, but to the substantial issue, yeah, um, it is prehistory so it's not my expertise. Uh, I often say to people, I know rather a lot about 300 BC to AD 300 and not much outside of that time zone. 
Um, and so obviously we're talking about long before that time zone. But I do read uh, the Bible and I read what ancient readers of the Bible uh, thought. And I've come very firmly to the view, not based on the science, but based on studying uh, the scriptures, uh, that the early chapters of Genesis were not written to be read as concrete history. I think by chapter 12 it is concrete history because the writing style moves more to look like historical prose, more like what you find in the Gospels, actually, which are clearly historical prose. But prior to Genesis 12, it's far more like, um, not quite poetry, but somewhere between poetry and parable, is, is how I genuinely think those chapters when they were written, were meant to be read. And we all know that there are many different styles in the Bible. I mean, Jesus told parables that weren't true history. They were parables, to make a point. There are Psalms that use metaphor. There's the book of Revelation that uses a style of literature. So I'm pretty comfortable with those opening chapters of Genesis uh, not being concrete history. And only then do I think about the science. So for me, it's not that the science has forced me to think this about the Bible. It's thinking about the Bible that's forced me to think that, that I can now look at the science and come and form a view, you know, either way. So if the science compelled me to think the uh, earth is just 6,000 years old and uh, God made the world in six days, I'm perfectly comfortable because I can see how that could fit with Genesis, obviously. Uh, um, that fits with the, the, the surface reading of Genesis. But if I find myself compelled by the arguments about the origin of the universe that say the universe is 13.8 billion years old, back to the Big Bang, and that um, uh, human beings are hundreds of thousands, Homo sapiens, hundreds of thousands of years old, I'm, I'm comfortable to accept that too, because my view of the scripture doesn't commit me to any particular view of the science. Now, I have become convinced on scientific grounds that the old earth is the correct science that the overwhelming lines of evidence uh, indicate that the universe is 13.8 billion years old and that human beings have been here for uh, hundreds of thousands of years. And I'm very comfortable with that and my, my view of the scriptures isn't at all interrupted uh, by that. But I recognise that I have smart Christian friends who um, love the Bible uh, and love science who come to a different view, who still hold that it's um, to be read as concrete history. And I want to... I want to have uh, respect for them. And, uh, and count uh, Stephen Ham, um, the son of Ken Ham, as, as a mate. Uh, and he's like big in the uh, creationist movement. And he's been very sweet to me and all of my heresies. I just wanted to ask this in case there's other men in the hall <clears throat> feeling that the same. Is it possible humility comes in different levels? Um, and by way of explanation of the question, um, I'd like to think I can express humility as a Christian, but if I was to compare myself with some other men in this room who are amazing Christian men and people that uh, I, I sort of surround myself with to become better, their humility is on another level mm. compared to what mine is, mm. even though I sort of work at it. Is that possible for that to be the case? Yes, of course it is. I mean, um, notwithstanding the observation a moment ago that humility ultimately is a gift, like genuine humility before God is a gift. Um, but there's a, there is a human humility, just as there are, there's a human love, right? Um, and I, I think God meets us as we are. Um, and so we, we all have different personalities and different uh, makeups. And I'm not uh, entirely sure that the super sort of arrogant, domineering personality type will necessarily end up being as um, as practically or visually humble as person as a person whose personality type is more receptive uh, to to humility to an ethic of humility but I am convinced that you can be more humble than you currently are I don't mean you that was a rhetorical you you's all can become more humble than you than you currently are and um, and, and and often these most humble people, they, they're not even thinking about being humble because they're not even thinking about themselves. Uh, they're thinking of God and others. And that, uh, that idea of, you know, stop focusing on being humble and just think about God and others is, uh, is actually wonderfully freeing. 
Uh, and when you meet someone like that, it is so powerful, it is so attractive, that actually you get drawn into the experience of um, trying to imitate that. Yeah. Hey, thanks so much. Thank you.